The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for attending today's lab. My name is Emma Cortina. I'm here to talk to you guys about 3D charts today and uh, some charts that are not exactly 3D, but uh, we grouped them right in here just for fun. Um, go ahead and, oh, you guys are great. I've already got some folks uh, letting me know that I'm coming through loud and clear. Um, I appreciate you guys quite a bit. Welcome again. Let's see. So we're gonna direct our focus over to some charts that require a unique setup. I've um, grouped these together because they are all a little bit non-standard from uh, some of the other charts that we've used and some of the more common ones that are used in Exago. As always, I have uh, all of my colleagues here. Uh, we actually have three people behind the scenes today for questions. So at any point, if you have any or missed something, let us know. Uh, we'll get you a response as soon as possible. Um, a quick announcement, we actually have a new team member here today, Brandon. So if you feel so inclined, uh, send him a message, say welcome. Uh, he's gonna handle some of the questions as well on the back end today, and we're happy to have him. The recording will be hosted after the lab's completion, uh, likely by end of day, at least by tomorrow. And uh, y'all should receive a recording um, since you signed up for the lab as well. Now, before we dive in, I just wanted to mention that in 21.1's GA release, we will be releasing stacked area charts as well as radar charts. Um, keep a lookout for that expansion to our current chart offering. That version is slated to roll out in Q1 of 2021, which is almost upon us already. Uh, so keep your eyes peeled for that. All right, onward we go. A quick overview of today's lab. So we're gonna review the setup as well as use cases for scatter charts, bubble charts, and finally heat maps. Heat maps are new to Exago in version 2020.1 dot three. They are a unique feature in that they were actually added to a maintenance build as opposed to a major release. So you're going to want to pay attention to that third value in your version number to see if they are available yet to you. A uh, quick reminder, if you're in the Exago front end, you should be able to press control shift V all together and a dialog will pop up with your version information. So if you're not sure, uh, try that handy little trick. Uh, and see if heat maps are even viable for, for your current version. There is a good possibility that your environment will not yet include them due to how new they are. The latest version out at this point in time uh, is 2020.1.9. So they were just a few versions ago. Don't worry if you don't see them available yet. Maybe go bother your admins to update. Uh, scatter and bubble charts have been around for a while. So most of you should be able to try your hand at those after today's lab if you would like. All right, so we're gonna to begin today with scatter charts. Uh, scatter charts can be single or multi-series. They use pairs of quantitative data values as coordinates for points on a grid. Now they can be used to find relationships or correlations between two variables in a data set. In other words, they can show us how much one variable is affected by another, but please keep in mind, uh, Stats 101 states that correlation does not imply causation. So these charts can start to show patterns that can lead us to dig deeper into root causes. Let's imagine that the markers on our scatter plot form nearly a straight line, right? The two variables are then displaying a high correlation since an increase in one value seems to indicate a subsequent increase in the other value. The points are very spread out, seemingly at random. The chart is displaying a low correlation between our X and Y values. If these charts are built in a single series format, each point will be the same shape and rotate theme colors uh, through the points on the chart. If they're built to show multiple series, we're gonna walk through both examples today, the series will be differentiated by color and shape of the points where one series point values share color and shape, of course, uh, and the theme colors will still be used. I'm also gonna overview bubble charts before we move over to a local install. Uh, bubble charts can be single or multi-series as well, although today we're only going to look at a single series example. And bubble charts are really a variation of a scatter chart. So 
we'll show you a couple options for scatter charts and then sort of extend that into the 3D offering that bubble charts expose. They similarly use uh, pairs of quantitative values as coordinates for data points on a grid, but these points are now displayed as a bubble. Bubble charts also take a third numeric data value that determines the size of each bubble, and this is where our third dimension is introduced. They allow you to display a uh, additional information on the chart that can be observed at a glance without interacting with the chart by way of hovering for a tooltip or potentially using a drill down. In the case of multi-series bubble charts, series will be differentiated by bubble color. All right, so we're going to go ahead uh, over to my local. We're going to take a look at these charts. We'll talk about interpreting them as well as how to set them up. Um, you should have a good understanding of building them functionally as well as intelligently with the data interpretation in mind. All right. So before I run this report, I want to talk a little bit about the use case. Uh, I'd like to just really cement that in all of your minds so uh, that we can grasp it before we're distracted by the output on screen. On this chart, we're going to be looking for a relationship between the unit price of each product compared to the sum of the revenue generated by each product. We will potentially see correlation here if relatively the same number of each product has been purchased, since then higher unit prices would mean higher revenue values. However, potentially customers gravitate towards the lower priced items. This could mean that items with lower unit prices might generate more revenue overall if they account for a significant enough amount of orders. Right, so now that we've discussed the data and what this chart might show us, let's take a peek. So the first version I have here is a single series scatter chart. I'm going to run it and start with the output. Now, single series scatter charts take only two data fields, and here I'm using the two mentioned previously. We have a unit price of each product as our X coordinate and the sum of the revenue, again, for each product as our Y coordinate. This means that one point is plotted for each intersection. So it will be crucial to ensure that we pull from the right section of data in our report for these types of charts, as is for all types of charts. Um, I just am gonna hammer that home every chance I get. Uh, when we get to the design of this report, I'll show you exactly what I mean. The other thing to understand about the output of this chart is that we don't have any way of indicating which value or product in this case, each point relates to. Now in this example, I've built a drill down into the structure such that we can still deliver this information to the chart consumer. You'll see that if I choose a point and click it, my drill down will show the product name, and I've also included the unit price and revenue values just for ease. Each point drill down will only show me one value for every point on this chart because I'm charting the intersection of unit price and total revenue for each individual product. So I'll just pull up a couple to illustrate that. Right, so we just get a little information about each product by interacting with the chart. Let's head over to the design. We'll talk about the setup. So this particular example is the simplest that we're going to look at today. It consists of a single sort on product name. And of course, to match, we have a single level of grouping, again, on product name. I've included the unit price data field. Now, I do just want to explain why this doesn't need to be an aggregate. Um, there should be one unique unit price for each product in my data set. So I don't need to uh, add these up or average them because there should be only one unique value for each uh, iteration of this footer here. Total revenue, on the other hand, does need to be an aggregate because we will have multiple orders containing each product. So if we only included the revenue data field in this footer, Exago would pull the last value for each product, which would give us skewed and, of course, incorrect results. Opening up the chart wizard, I'll start in the type tab. Um, fairly straightforward, we, of course, selected scatter as our chart type. Now, in the data tab, I have assigned my X values and my Y values. 
um, you'll notice that we do have the three data layout options available to us, though the requirements for input are going to be slightly different. Um, as you're seeing right here, these two have to be numeric. That's the biggest difference here. We can add an additional series, just like with other chart types. All right, now I did change the theme on this chart uh, from the default to prismatic wave. It's simply a personal favorite, uh, but I have not added any additional aesthetic customizations outside of uh, the linked report, of course, that I already demonstrated. I actually created this linked report by duplicating the report that you see here and modifying what was shown. We can take a quick look at that. So you'll see I have the same footer on product name and I've simply changed what is displayed in it. Um, if you would like additional info on linked reports, Tim Light did a wonderful lab earlier this year that I highly recommend. Uh, we are not going to spend any more time today on it. I do like to keep these shorter uh, so as not to interrupt your day significantly and just a quick tidbit of info on Exago. Uh, and I do wanna keep things focused on these charts today. So I'm going to take a quick pause and just check out the questions pane, make sure everybody is following right along here. All right, we got a big thumbs up there, so it looks like we're doing well. Let's move right along and take a look at the multi-series version of this chart. So similar to the lab that I actually did with you guys two months ago, we're going to build a multi-series chart that uses a different data layout type, uh, row-based. If you guys recall, the major difference between a column-based multi-series chart and a row-based multi-series chart is that with column-based, we will have two separate and distinct metrics shown per each x-axis value. In a row-based chart, we will show one metric broken down by two series values, which will have a nested relationship. Running this report, we can see the scatter pattern <laughs> uh, is identical to our single series. And in fact, we are charting the same information here. I kept this consistent to draw attention not to the data or the chart interpretation, but to the differences between the two examples. The difference here is that I've added a series that allows us to better and more specifically categorize the values by their product category. Now, each series is represented by different shapes and colors, where before they were all circles of uh, various theme colors within that prismatic wave theme. We have our legend on the right, uh, and our tooltips now show the series value in addition to the X and Y value. Personally, I find multi-series scatter charts significantly more informative simply because they can include a non-numeric breakdown. Uh, of course, this will always depend on your use case and data structure, so you know, take it with a grain of salt. I additionally built the same uh, linked report into this chart, so we can still get to the product name level if I choose. These are some good ones that I've chosen today. All right, true to form, we're going to take a look at the design. Um, not much changes here, honestly. I have the same footer on product name. Um, the biggest difference is that we have added the category name field to that footer, so we can uh, show the associated category info for each product. And then I have changed the layout of our chart. So let's take a look at that. Type is the same. We're starting with just a basic scatter chart. We're using row-based chart or data layout three if you're used to the older versions of Exago. Uh, my assignments for X and Y are exactly the same as before, but I've added that series label um, as well to our chart here. Nothing changed on the appearance tab. I have the same theme, uh, so we kept everything pretty simple there. All right, so we're going to hop into bubble charts now and take a look at what we've got over there. If I run this report, we are looking at the average unit price of products within an entire category. So if you can imagine um, sort of levels of data, we've taken a step back and are evaluating the relationship between unit price and revenue, but one level up, if you will. Uh, instead, of, instead of having, um, let's look at the unit price for each individual product, we are looking at the average unit price for every product in 
let's say the beverages category, comparing it to dairy products, so on and so forth. We still have the sum of the revenue as our Y coordinate, but again, across the entire category in this uh, example. The total number of orders for each category is going to determine our bubble size. So that is the additional metric that we've introduced here as our third numeric value to build a bubble chart. And finally, the category name will serve as our bubble labels. The nice thing about bubble charts is that option to specify the bubble label. So we can clearly identify one category from another. And the tricky part I'd like to warn you about uh, is that the bubble labels can get really messy if we have too many data points on our chart. Uh, or if all of the points are congregated in a single area of the chart. So I do find them more helpful for higher level visualizations like this one, as opposed to the product level chart um, that we were building with the scatter charts previously. Now I do also have the linked report on this chart and I have linked the same report. Let's just bring up a couple of these and let me explain what we're dealing with here. So the reason that I wanted to go through this exercise is that interacting with the linked report here shows all of the products within each category. And it actually, in this case, helps to shed a little bit more light on the reason behind our output. For example, beverages has quite a few more products within the category than meat and poultry. So perhaps that's more related to the reason that the revenue is so much higher than the unit price of each of those products. Um, just wanted to add a little bit more support to the argument that correlation does not in fact indicate causation. All right, so once again, let's take a look at the design of this chart. First, we'll notice that I have a grouping on category names. So those of you that have used Exago uh, were probably expecting that I had moved that grouping up. I do have the sort to match. Uh, so no more product name, just category name here. This means that all of these uh, data fields and aggregate information are going to pull once for each category name instead of once for each product name in this case. Now I have the calculation for average unit price instead of just the unit price. Um, as I, I just wanna mention, as I do click on these, uh, you'll mention, you'll, excuse me, notice the formula bar updates um, to show you that formula. So if you're having any trouble uh, reading the formulas in the suppressed cells, just take a peek up there. We still have the sum of the revenue, again, showing for each category. Um, I also have this aggregate count uh, of each order. And of course, that's going to determine our bubble size in this case, and then finally the bubble label. All right, so in the wizard, first and foremost, we pick the bubble chart type. You'll notice that we have the uh, same X and Y coordinates as the scatter chart, aside from the added aggregate on the unit price field. And then I've assigned the bubble size and labels, just as I mentioned, uh, nothing crazy here. I do have access to my data layout menu, so I can change that if I like. I stuck with column based in this case. And again, I can add another series uh, if your data does support this. This is quite a bit of info uh, on one chart. If um, you do uh, attempt a layout like this, um, but it is supported if you have the data for it. The rest is not customized beyond a theme. Again, I have kept the details of the charts uh, outside of the data assignment very simple for today. So our focus can remain on these use cases. All right, so now the topic that you've all probably come to this lab for, we're gonna talk about heat maps. Just gonna go back to my slide deck um, to talk about some of the details, and then we'll, we'll go ahead into an example, of course. So heat maps, again, are new to 2020.1.3 of Exago. If you joined a little bit late, um, that is a very recent version. So you might not uh, have access to them yet in your production environment. Heat maps have two related axes with one to six data series arranged on the XY grid. Color or shade of color in many cases using a gradient display indicates data magnitude. 
Each cell or block of color in the grid can also show up to five additional values, one in each corner of the block, and those display as text, and the fifth in the center, again, just a value display. It'll, it'll show you the value in text. Um, that's how you can end up with potentially six series in your heat map. So it sounds like a lot, but these can actually display that much information in a very informative and consumable manner. Additional information can be configured to display in a tooltip if desired. So you have the option of what actually shows up in that tooltip, and I'll show you that in just a moment. The last thing I want to mention here, because it is different from other charts in Exago, heat maps must use a column-based layout, and we'll see how that works on the front end in just a moment. Um, they do support drill downs. So if you are uh, interested in configuring a drill down, you absolutely can do so. I didn't do that for the heat map today. I want to keep the focus on the uh, heat map setup. All right, so let's check it out. First, we're going to start with a simple example. Um, this heat map is single series. It is showing the total revenue for the intersection between an employee and a given order year. I've configured the years to display along the x-axis and of course the employees along the y-axis. We do have a nice scale on the right. So this is where our legend usually shows, right? the charts in Exago. I'm going to take a look up this chart, and we're actually going to tweak it together to show more than one series. So let's go ahead over to the designer and take a look at that. First things first, we have two sorts on this chart, and year is the primary sort in this case. Um, this is very important. We are pulling data from the last name footer. You can see that um, behind my screen here. If the primary sort is not on year, we are only going to get data for the last year in our data set. I'm going to demonstrate this simply because it is a very common mistake with all chart types. Um, and since heat maps are new, I want to remove a little bit of the ambiguity that could be involved um, and, and sort of prep you guys for what to check first if you're seeing an output like uh, the one I'm about to show you. If I run this heat map now, I'm going to see all of my employees correctly displayed, but only one year on the bottom, which is, of course, not really what we're looking for here. If you see this, you're probably very close to the desired chart output and just need to take a look at your sorts. But just a quick warning there for any of you that might be new to the um, design experience here. All right, uh, so the next thing that we're going to do is show an additional series value. So let's say uh, we want to show the total orders for each employee for each year in addition to the revenue in each cell. I know that we haven't looked at how this heat map is set up yet, but I'm going to prep our canvas for the additional series before going into the chart wizard so that we can talk about it and add the second series all at once. So all we need to do here is add the calculation to our footer, and I'm actually going to use our formula bar to do so. Um, guys, I'll plug this every chance I get. If you haven't gotten around to trying out the formula bar feature, I highly recommend it. It makes formula writing so much easier. Um, you don't have to go into any separate dialogues. Um, it's so quick, and it does have that completion logic built in as well. So we're going to do the count of the order IDs here. Easy peasy. All right, now I'm going to open the chart wizard. Now, first and foremost, we selected heat map. It appears down uh, at the very bottom of the type screen next to combination charts. In the data tab, um, this is where we start to really go off the reservation from uh, other chart types, right? So first and foremost, I do not have the option to change the data layout, right? Uh, heat map charts only allow column-based chart data layout, and the tooltip is making that pretty explicit for us right here. We're going to assign X and Y values in the top section, 
right? So this part's pretty simple. As I mentioned, I'll use year as the X uh, and employee last name as the Y value. We do have independent sort configuration options for each of those, uh, as well as an option to check percentage mode, which will transform the data to a percentage range between zero and 100. I'm pretty straightforward there as well. Now we separately configure our display area, which is the area within the actual grid. So you can control any elements that display in each cell on your heat map chart. Currently, this is only set to include one series value, the revenue, and it's displaying in the center of my display area. It is configured to display the value in the tooltip. Um, it has a name to show in the tooltip, as well as formatting. Formatting is available on uh, a field-by-field -field basis for each series. It is very helpful in this case, uh, as this is a monetary value, so I can add currency symbols and remove my decimal places just for space considerations. Now we're gonna use this button to add an additional series. Gonna select the count of the order IDs. Just like I mentioned, uh, you'll notice show in tooltip defaults to on. So uh, if you do want those all shown, you don't need to change anything there. And I'm gonna give it a display name. Now display name is optional, but also highly recommended. Uh, if I don't give it a display name, the tooltip will actually show the full formula. So not as helpful for um, uh, user is not as uh, clean looking on the output. So I'm going to use order count to explain what we're showing here. Again, we can format. I'll just take some decimal places out. All right. Now, finally, um, I can adjust the position of each display value within the cell using the drag and drop indicator on the left side. So these can be moved independent of any other series in the chart, which means I can optionally choose to show series uh, maybe in just the bottom two corners in, uh, without having series in the center and top. I'll just go ahead and add that order count series back. There we go. Um, this gives you quite a bit of control over the output of uh, your heat map here. So if you prefer um, different alignments than center and top left, right? You don't have to have five to get down to the bottom options there. Um, one thing I wanna mention, if we do have more than one series and the chart is not big enough to show the labels without overlapping them, uh, specifically um, vertically big enough, generally you'll see more issues with uh, vertical sizing than horizontal as usually our charts are wide enough, uh, but not quite tall enough to show labels, uh, the center will be prioritized and the peripheral values will not be shown on the output. So if you're seeing that behavior, it's likely not a bug or something that you've done wrong. Uh, just make your chart a little bigger and see if they show up. All right, now our appearance tab is also different. Um, so let me just go ahead and set this up again. Looks like I confused it a little bit. Sorry about that, guys. All right, there we go. Um, so the appearance tab is also different. We have the option to specify which series assigns our color here. And we can choose a theme of colors to use on the chart. I actually built a custom theme for this lab that goes from red to green, but any of your existing chart themes should be viable for heat maps as well. So we can still brand them to match the rest of your charts. I do wanna show you a difference in the output interaction if we switch this from uh, gradient to interval. I'm gonna go ahead and make that change here. And I'll show you that on the output. So we'll go ahead and finish our chart. If I give it a run, we are going to see two series values per um, cell in our grid. We'll see both of those display in the tooltip with the labels that we've given them. And then finally, the difference in the legend is that we no longer have that scale, the, the slider scale. Uh, instead, we have five legend values that are also interactive. Now, the interval option um, means that we specify a range of values assigned to each color. So in this case, we're clicking to eliminate that range of values that you can change in the chart design um, in a slightly different way than with the uh, gradient option. All right, so we are right on the money for 30 minutes today, and that is gonna round out our lab content. I'm gonna pop back over to 
my slide deck uh, just to talk about the upcoming labs. Um, we are keeping an eye on the questions pane, so if you're finishing up a question, please feel free to send it in whenever you're ready. Um, one of us will be happy to take a look. Upcoming in January, we have some information on REST setup and uh, some security considerations there as well, how to configure that um, fun info uh, associated. In February, we'll be revisiting data layout types. This was one of the first labs that I did four years ago, and I'm really excited to give it a facelift, um, sort of continuing with the chart theme here that we've had for a few months. In March, we're going to cover Troubleshooting for Admins Part 2. If you haven't checked out Troubleshooting for Admins Part 1, I invite you to do so to get ready for Part 2. Uh, and then in April, we'll uh, talk about conditional formatting and, and, of course, we'll talk about charts as well as uh, cell formatting there. If I don't talk to you guys before uh, the holidays, enjoy and uh, stay safe. I hope all of your families are happy and healthy. Um, thank you, as always, for attending the lab, and I'm happy reporting, guys. <laughs>